Eggnog is one of those things I feel like I shouldn't like for various reasons, but I still do. That pretty much sums up my thoughts on Christmas entirely. For the longest time, the nostalgia I felt around the holidays was always shrouded in melancholy, at least throughout my 20s, and I'm sure that's the case for many of you my age. What was once a gift-filled day, followed by a 13-hour drive to see my grandparents, has become something else entirely. I often found myself remembering family and loved ones who have passed away or just may not be around anymore. I'd sardonically chuckle at how I once believed in magical things like Santa Claus. And I secretly longed for that sense of wonderment the season once brought me. I'm not here to indulge in that rather cynical thought process, though. In fact, I'm here to tell you that your nostalgia is much like a semicolon. It's something that could arrange your thoughts more clearly, but you're probably using it incorrectly. Rather heavy opening, I know. What does it all have to do with the toy that saved Christmas? The thing in the title, and the thumbnail, and the tags in the video. Well, many people have fond memories of VeggieTales, and I'm no exception to that. And I have a very specific memory involved with this movie that I consider a strong tether to my past. And before I even get started with that, why don't we take a seat by my old Christmas tree on my humble futon and see if there's any magic to be found in this old green VHS tape that I have. So for the few of you that might not know, VeggieTales is an animated show from the 90s that aims to tell stories with, if not straight from the Bible, at least biblical themes. Usually what they do is they would retell a Bible story and then they sort of gloss over the more unchild-friendly parts in order to tell something more jaunty. Uh, I think the story of Joshua and the slushies and everything is probably a good example if you want to really analyze just how much they avoided some of the really heinous stuff from the Bible. But every now and again they would do a special where it's their own original story no biblical influence really whatsoever. I'm pretty sure even today that among VeggieTales fans, this is a movie that is played on an almost yearly basis around this time. So let's see what all the hype is about. Happily ever after. The end. That was a neat story, Grandpa George. Can you tell me another one? Oh, I'd love to, Annie. But if you don't get some sleep, you're gonna be pooped tomorrow. And you know what tomorrow is? Christmas? So there are two things that are quite clear right off the bat. One is the Princess Bride sort of framing device for the story that we're about to hear. Oh, please, Grandpa, just one more story. Oh, all right. I suppose one more story won't hurt. The other thing you might have noticed is that the animation has not really held up after all these years, but I think the further we get into it, you guys will see that they really did work with what they had for this. Now, let's see. A Christmas story. Oh, did I ever tell you about the town that didn't get Christmas? What was the name of that? Dinkletown, that's it. I used to deliver the mail there. So we start with a musical number, which again, in Veggie Tales, are almost always at least kind of fun to listen to. Maybe not good on a technical level, I don't really know, but they're always fun, and I'm surprised that they haven't gotten annoying like a lot of songs I listened to when I was a kid. So that's, that's a good start. I, I don't know what kind of housing community or town this is supposed to be, but I'm kind of surprised that I never questioned this as a kid. Oh my god, kids, just let him find house number four. Just let him find house number four, please. And this right here is sort of where the story and the moral of the episode kind of comes into play. Say, kids, have you got the don't know what I want for Christmas blues? Well, if I know anything about toys, and you know I do, I know just what you're looking for. We've kind of seen this storyline before. It's just sort of taking the anti-consumerism Christmas is about yada, yada, yada sort of approach. You guys will 
see later on. They always eventually crowbar in Christian themes, sometimes more subtly than others, but it, usually it grinds the story to a halt just to kind of... Y you'll see. You want a toy that's fun! You want a toy that's cute! But most of all, you want a toy with a fully functional buzzsaw built into its right arm! That's right! You want Buzzsaw Louie! knows the true meaning of Christmas. All you have to do is press his nose. Christmas is when you get stuff. And the toy that these kids are all obsessing over is Buzzsaw Louie. And when they eventually bring him to life, the movie doesn't even really try to explain. They just sort of say it happens, and I kind of respect it for that. Well, as the toys were coming down assembly line and having their noses tested, one of them winced. He grimaced, made a face, didn't like the sound of the words that was coming out of his own head. Because, you know, you're a Christian movie, you can't just say God made it come to life and you can't... It's... Yeah, he just made a face. Just... Just started thinking. Just... Just gained consciousness. Maybe he was wired different. Who knows? Anyway... All the kids start complaining to their parents that they want a Buzzsaw Louie, they want a Buzzsaw Louie, they want a Buzzsaw Louie. They don't know what it is, and they don't know why they did, but they want a Buzzsaw Louie. And then we find out, of course, that the toy maker is played by the two characters that almost always play a villain on this show, at least at this era of VeggieTales. You mean you wanted those kids to be all whiny? Mm-hmm. I don't get it, boss. You see, Mr. Lunt, the only way their parents will get them to stop whining is to buy them lots of toys. And as the owner of the Nezzer Toy Factory, I'll make out like a bandit. And they even make a cute little reference to a past appearance that they both had as the villain and sidekick, which I'm going to reference in brief later on, but you will see why. Anyway, they're conspiring on how to make the Buzzsaw Louie just take over the toy market and they just don't care about any of the ethics behind it. We've all seen it before. It's just another mustache twirling moment from VeggieTales. And then we move briefly into the consciousness thing that I mentioned, and then we go on to another musical number, which is, again, surprisingly good. Maybe not breathtaking or anything, but like I said, surprisingly good. Another really welcome thing from the VeggieTales series is that the musical numbers never outstay their welcome, so even if you don't agree with me that they're fine, you, you don't have to really stick around for them for that long. I'm just a toy, I don't claim to be a genius, but there must be more to So Buzzsaw Louie does what Buzz Lightyear could not in Toy Story 2. He easily escapes the toy store and turns into a snowball and rolls to the bottom of the hill and dies. That's a lie. He's a toy. He can't die. He was never alive. What is consciousness? And it may seem like the music is just coming left and right in this, and it, that's because it is, because now it's time for Silly Songs with Larry, the part of the show where Larry comes out and sings, sings a silly song. It's Christmas Eve, and Larry is anxiously awaiting the arrival of Santa Claus with a plate of cookies. Now, I know for a lot of people, these are the highlights of the whole episode, both from kids up to adults, and that's because Larry's just a fun character. He's well-animated, well-designed, if not incredibly simple like the rest of the characters here. But there's a certain charm to all of the songs because they usually are able to tell jokes that kids also find funny, while being slightly more mature in order to get adults in on the joke, like referencing soap operas and stuff like that. And I always appreciate the fact that the kids never feel too lost on the joke. You've got the Viking, you've got the snowmaker up there that's makeshift, which I find kind of adorable. It's all done on a set that looks like a kitchen counter. And I'm really glad that jokes, you know, never escape the wits of the chip. Larry is greeted now by an agent of the Internal Revenue Service. Who are you? I'm from the IRS, and I've come to attack charge. So our three main characters who are introduced uh, this far into the movie stumble upon Buzzsaw Louie in the snow, and one of the best jokes in VeggieTales rears its head. Bob, Bob, are you okay? Mousetrap. Huh? I wanted to play Mousetrap. You roll your dice, you move your mice. Nobody gets hurt. Hey, this 
must be the trail to the Pugsleyville Bridge. The what? That bridge that collapsed. You know, we heard about it on TV. Boy, we're sure lucky we didn't go down there. Look what I found! That's a buzzsaw Louie! Cool! Push his nose! Push his nose! Okay. You need more toys. Now that's the true meaning of Christmas. No, it isn't. Who said that? I did. That's not what Christmas is about. It's not? No. It's almost hilarious in itself just how quickly they adjust to a talking toy. It makes you wonder why in Toy Story they're just uh, so shy about it. Christmas isn't about whining and begging for more toys. Well, then what is it about? I don't know. But I'm going to find out. I'm on an adventure. Ooh. So Bob the Tomato says that he knows someone that's really, really smart. And then they leave to find out that that really, really, really smart person is... Me! You, Grandpa George? They get there, and that moment that I described earlier where the story goes to a screeching halt to just implement the Christian message of the show just happens, because they just kind of stop the whole thing to go over the Bible story about Christmas and... We've all heard it before. Let me be clear, I don't have a problem with the Christian message that they get across here. They're not doing the, it put the Christ in Christmas sort of thing. They're really just saying it's about giving, and that's the symbolism between what Jesus represents. It's the ultimate gift. So they head back to town, and they discover that all the kids are just being so bratty that they have to go out into the street and just brat about how bratty they are. <laughs> And they're just like, we need to go to the toy factory and put a stop to this. So they break into the toy factory, which also happens to have its own production room for commercials and stuff like that just in there. That's right! It was Mr. Nezza's television studio! And also, time to just draw attention to the fact that the evil guy has penguins. So they do a commercial live on the air. <laughs> And uh, I always had problems understanding some of the stuff that Junior said as a kid. And with the advent of DVD players and higher resolution versions of these episodes, it helps a bit, but... I'm not that toys are bad. I have a fear myself that I enjoy very much. The commercial gets everyone in town to suddenly change their tune about being greedy on Christmas. Sure. But they only finish the commercial in time before the big scary boss man comes in and breaks everything up, live on air. Decided to borrow my TV studio. Uh, uh -oh. it looks like we're about to experience some technical difficulties. <laughs> and of course, all the parents see their children get nabbed off of you know, a live broadcast and are just, well, it's right up there, guys, let's go save our kids, yeah, right? And now we get into one of my favorite aspects about VeggieTales, and that's how VeggieTales is able to just sort of skirt past the subject of death until they don't. Listen, the only thing kids want to know about Christmas is that they're going to get more toys, and I intend to keep it that way. That's why I'm gonna have to send you boys on a little trip. Let's see, where would you like to go? Wibblestown? Bumbleyburg? Just don't send us to Pugsleyville. The bridge is out. Pugsleyville! Oh, I hear it's nice this time of year! Sometimes they just don't, and there's no other way to interpret it. They've rechanged things like slaughterings of a whole towns and civilizations. It only gets weirder the older I get, and I think like, man, this guy is literally about to send these guys to a shut-down bridge on a sled so that they'll just fly off the edge and die. They'll just fall. That's not masking it. He's, he's gonna kill these kids and a sentient toy. Luckily, though, the parents show up and they give him a teddy bear, which, as we all know, it's just one 
gift and gesture of kindness to change the heart of a greedy capitalist. That's all it takes. That's all it takes is one act of kindness and everything will be fine. Unfortunately, our villain does not have great spatial awareness and ends up accidentally sending the kids down the chute to their death anyway. And in response, goes down there himself on a sled. Look, isn't it cute? Uh-huh, uh-huh. I'm really sorry for all the trouble I caused and I'm gonna make it up. What? Oh, no! Mr. Lunt, another sled! I'll save them! And then we get a cool sequence, which I actually remember liking a lot as a kid. Like, to me, this was the part that I always watched the movie for, was for the daring rescue. And I think it's just because I liked sledding a lot. But this was the sequence that I always found fun, and this is the part where we see, uh... A buzzsaw do something that a buzzsaw actually could never do in real life. Please don't try any of this at home, children. Something I do enjoy that's actually a pretty good twist on what I think most people would predict would happen in a kid's movie is that the main characters end up saving themselves only for the villain to have ended up putting himself in the dire situation instead. Let's see what this baby can really do! stretching the bounds of logic and basic physics. And then Uncle George shows up to actually save them from this situation that they have no way of getting out of. And it's at this point where you start to question, how do you know this story? You are in it three times at the beginning, middle, and end. Unreliable narrator, I think. What do you think, Steve? The movie ends on a pretty decent tracking shot that shows everyone getting along, having a wonderful Christmas, and this is one thing I actually do think the VeggieTales movies are good at, are these tracking shots that can tell a story without creating a lot of complex visuals for themselves to handle. Town. At first, he wanted to have his buzzsaw surgically removed so nobody would get hurt. But then he finally figured out what it was good for. What? Making furniture. Why, he filled Dinkletown with new tables and chairs and hutches and spice racks and those little things to hang your mugs on. And well, you get the picture. You can definitely see the constraints that they're under, but that only highlights how creative everyone at Big Idea really was. Yep, it was the best Christmas ever. Like any VeggieTales special, it's certainly fun in some ways, but it's not something I plan to screen on a regular basis. Which begs the question, why so much nostalgia for this VeggieTales short in particular? Well, and I'm sure a lot of you have memories similar to something like this, the fondest Christmas memory I have from my childhood, a memory I recall with striking vividness, is of me waking up super early on Christmas morning and then watching this movie for what was probably the hundredth time. We would stay the night at my grandparents' on Christmas Eve, as would much of my extended family, despite the house's accommodation size being stretched to its absolute limits. Gathered around a small TV VCR combo was me, all my siblings, my cousins that stayed the night, all those people, and just, we were eating cereal, drinking grape soda, because, you know, on Christmas we were allowed to do whatever we wanted, basically. And we were just waiting to open our presents, watching this movie, 
and in my head it felt like forever, but it was probably only closer to a half hour. I think about that time often, and almost always in a different way the older I get. Which is what brings us back around to that form of nostalgia I was telling you about that probably eats away at your holiday spirit. Wouldn't it be great to be able to wake up and have something as simple as Christmas morning be a life-changing rush of dopamine, serotonin, and all the other chemicals that make any emotion exist? You know, it's usually after the inevitable failure to recapture a time you cherish, you know, with that doomer, entropy-ridden thought that always sets in. You probably know someone whose holiday spirit, or Christmas, Thanksgiving, Halloween, whatever, is marred or completely ruined by past experiences with it. Not necessarily bad experiences, good ones. Sitting around drinking grape soda, not being able to wait to open your presents, for example. None of this is news to you, I'm sure. But how did my longing for the past, for instance, which at one point in my life was something that would send me into a spiraling depression, become such a force for good in my life? How did that longing turn into something that gave me more purpose and perspective? In a peer-reviewed article that is basically the whole building block to this video, The Meaning of Nostalgia, it is suggested that recognizing this longing for the past can act as a buffer between you and existential threats. The article speaks at length about how people can channel a personality relevant to their experience into something that gives their life meaning and can even attribute to psychological equanimity. I then had to look up what equanimity meant just to make sure. I had an idea, but I wanted to be sure. A stigma exists that sees nostalgia as a feeble mental attempt to relive a fond memory or even to take refuge within that memory. It's a source of gloomy realization as much as it is a pleasant trip down memory lane. Christmas, for many people, is a month that merely reminds them of a better, more magical time that they had in their life as a kid. Something I think a lot of people grow understandably resentful of. I personally hate things like the inherent consumerism surrounding the holiday, but hey, that's something that they've been complaining about since the Charlie Brown days, so I'm not the first with that observation. There's also blow-up yard decorations. I think those are awful. I despise just about every Christmas song except for Feliz Navidad and Mary Did You Know. My point, of course, being that there's a lot to really hate about Christmas that's hard to defend on an ethical level, but you have to wonder where legitimate disdain ends and where it starts to become more about spite towards a season that no longer does for you what it once did. Why do I still generally like Christmas, though. I guess it's the same reason I can sit through a goofy Christian animated movie with a smile. When you get right down to it, it seems what people are nostalgic for are the things that, at one point in time at least, brought them immense joy. It was something that shaped their lives in one way or another. My problem was, I would then focus on how to obtain that moment again, instead of recognizing what it means for the present and, indeed, the future. The feeling I get around Christmas, the one I get when I watch this movie, reminds me of a time I could only have enjoyed in that mindset, in that very moment. I'm a type 1 diabetic now. Drinking this eggnog was really only a thing I did for the opening gag, and I'm kind of just holding it now. I can't even eat things like sugary cereal or grape soda. It at very least not like in the volumes I could at that age. And I'm not a very holy man compared to any version of my younger self. And I think generally I believe in less cosmic things the older I get. Especially not a red-robed man who is supposedly responsible for who brings me my Lego sets each year. I've produced a lot of films that I'm proud of and watched thousands. It's pretty impossible to approach just about any movie I once enjoyed as a kid without some sort of critical objectivity. Not only can I never re-experience one of the happiest memories I ever had as a child, I wouldn't know where to start in terms of recreating it. But I don't have to. 
I'm not trying to say that channeling nostalgia is the absolute key to finding meaning in your life. Obviously, the article is actually pretty clear that it's not for that, really. And I'm not calling it a cure-all for any stress or existential crisis you may be going through, but I can tell you that it gave me, a depressed and aimless young man, some much-needed perspective. And I guess what I'm getting at with this whole video and why I've been trying to do it for the last two years and only just now built up the the energy, the courage, it took a whole year of quarantine to make me finally do this one. I guess what I'm getting at is picture every moment you're in as though you're recalling it 20 years from now. I encourage you all, if anything, to use your favorite memories as a gauge. You will see just how far you've come and how much further you'll be able to go now that you're aware of your own trajectory. Simply because I'm perfectly keen on how much those Christmases of years past meant to me as a kid, I know to savor the moments I get with my family around the holidays now, to enjoy any moment I'm around people I care about to the fullest extent. Sifting through my own nostalgia in a meaningful way taught me to recognize the good old times before I leave them. It taught me to know the feeling of being home when it happens, and... Sounds corny, but that's the only place I want to be for the holidays. From the Ferguson clan and my whole household, happy holidays, stay safe, and remember, God made you special, and he loves you very much.